Okay, so, um, yeah, so what I'm going to do today is really just give you a bit of an overview of what the sort of things I think you should be thinking about when um, trying to think the, about the place of maths, I, I suppose, in bioscience degrees. Um, you know, a lot of people say that they, that students struggle after they're doing practicals and, and so on. So um, these are just some thoughts that you might want to pick up on. I'm only going to be touching on a number of things, so please do get in touch later if you want to talk about anything in any more detail. Um, okay, so I'm going to divide this topic into two parts, really. One is thinking about where students are coming from and understanding that, and then thinking about how we can integrate this into teaching and learning. And just a little bit before I start about where I'm coming from on all of this. So... My, you know, my research back in the day was um, maths modelling in receptor regulation. Um, and then I had a portfolio career for a while for various reasons. And I did a lot of um, small group teaching in Cambridge. And it was a real privilege to work with um, a lot of very talented students, but to get to know them particularly well. And that's really informed my what I'm going to be speaking about today. I also worked with a lot of disabled students. So... Um, dyslexia, dyspraxia, um, mental health issues, autism, um, but particularly with maths and physical and life sciences students. So that again has really informed me. Um, and then alongside that, I put together some education consultancy and there was a variety of things that I did, but one of the things I did was this um, essential maths for medics and vets online resources. So there's a lot of um, yeah, just resources uh, around um, PDFs, uh, animations, some of which are unfortunately flash, which no longer really work, but I have a lot of the source files. Um, there's lots of practice questions, diagnostic questions. So if anybody's interested, very, very happy to share their all Creative Commons license. Um, if anybody did use them over the last mm, 15 years or so, if you could get in touch, that would be really appreciated because it would be nice to know if they're still being used. Um, the other thing I did was um, as an as on the expert panel for the core math several three qualification. This is a really, really useful qualification to highlight to students who are thinking about doing bioscience degrees. Um, it's an alternative to A-level maths, and it really does a lot of the things that we would really like our biology students to have done. So please go and have a closer look at it. Um, it's all about applying sort of the GCSE maths ideas and concepts into other subjects. I then went off and did a PGC, secondary chemistry, and taught a lot of maths. And in the last couple of years of that, um, taught online, entirely online, for students with mental health issues who are not in school. So yeah, um, a lot of experience of teaching maths online. I also, because the last part of that was part-time, got back into university work. And now I'm at the University of Nottingham, and I've just had a full year of the pharmacology teaching for the graduate entry medicine, and I'm now thinking about what am I going to do for next year. Um, so, okay, so let's think about this understanding where students are coming from, first of all, because I think this is really, really, really important. So this was some work I did about 10 years ago um, for the Higher Education Academy, and this is 24 different higher education institutions. And we asked, uh, it was a questionnaire study, we asked about what qualifications students were coming in with. And you can see there's a massive range, ranging from 90% you know, GCSE only um, through to 100% A-level maths and everything in between. And at the same time, the Royal Society um, did a study of A-level choices and showed that 39% of students who took A-level biology also took A-level maths. So generally speaking, looking if you're going for the average student, they probably don't have A-level maths. They probably have GCSE maths. And of those who only had GCSE maths, over half of them had a B grade or lower. Um, it's worth remembering, I guess, that this year's first years, if they didn't take a gap year, will be the first cohort to have been through the nine to one GCSE maths. Um, so obviously the spec changed um, for these students. In practice, you know what? I don't think it made a massive difference. Um, uh, there, were, there were some differences around um, problem solving skills and things, but 
to be honest, they, they change the curriculum without really helping the teachers teach this stuff better. Um, so I think that the curriculum change has only had a, a limited impact. But anyway, what does this mean for us in terms of what our students are likely to know? So where should we be beginning, I guess, is what I'm saying. So the first thing is algebra. Typically, these students will not be able to rearrange an equation. Um, if students are coming in with a B grade or lower or a six, I suppose, in the new system or lower, they probably won't be able to do very much algebra. They are likely to have difficulty with concepts of ratio, and obviously that's going to be difficult um, if they're then doing dilutions. Uh, and then finally, they're not good with anything to do with logarithms. So these are all quotes from academic teaching staff who are teaching on these courses. Now, the thing about logarithms is <laughs> you don't do logarithms in GCSE. So I don't know why people are complaining about um, the fact that they haven't done it, it's, it's not a part of GCSE. It was in O-level, but it was dropped when GCSEs began. So these are sort of three common things that, um, that are commonly described of, about these students and about the difficulties they have with maths. And so I think, you know, what I, what I did in Cambridge, certainly, and what I'm planning to do for Nottingham next year, is taking the logarithm example. If you're teaching pharmacology, I mean, logarithms are essential, absolutely core to pharmacology. So, for example, when the pharmacokinetics part of the course starts, I would then put in a session before that pharmacokinetics started. And I would say, you know, if you don't know what E is, if you don't know what exponential decay is, if you don't know what a natural logarithm is, you have to come along to this optional session. Um, and generally speaking, they did come along and they found it much more useful. And it meant that when I was teaching the pharmacokinetics, I didn't have to teach the basic maths, the nuts and bolts of the maths. So um, yeah, so knowing, anticipating what they're not going to be able to do and putting in that intervention um, is I think a good idea. Diagnostic testing is an option. Um, I did it for a couple of years and I'm sort of asking the question, is it a good idea or not? Um, Cut to the chase, no, I don't think it's a good idea. Because what I saw, because don't forget, I was working with small groups of students, I got to know them really well. What I saw was that it just crushed their confidence. And confidence is just so, so important with maths, that if you crush their confidence, you will spend so much time trying to build it back up again. And I found for those years when I did do the diagnostic testing, gosh, did I regret it. Um, so I don't think a good idea. But what I did do after that was actually ask them about their confidence levels. And I found that so much more useful. Um, yeah, just, just, just simply saying, this is the sort of maths you know, we'd like you to be able to do. How do you feel about it? And just like a few like it scale questions. And that told me so much more that I needed to know. And that informed me about what I needed to put in place to, to make up that gap. Which leads me on nicely to this idea of maths anxiety and, and student expectation. So, you know, the big problem is the fear of maths. And I like this quote because it's maths is some kind of mystical dark art sent to terrorize biologists. Um, and, you know, a more positive attitude would allow them to overcome most of the issues. And, and that's why, you know, the more I think about it and the more I've done over the last 20 years of teaching this sort of thing is just confidence and self-efficacy. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the spider is there to remind me to say that yes, there's a big literature on maths anxiety, um, but if you delve deeply into some of that education psychology literature, the definition of maths anxiety, I feel is problematic. Um, and yeah, I haven't really got time to go into it today, but I think, yes, there are, a small minority of students who probably genuinely do have maths anxiety and I've taught some of them and and yes you can recognize it but I think the bigger problem is just the general lack of confidence and lack of you know, poor self-efficacy. Okay so now let's think about how we then design the teaching and learning and how can we integrate that into our courses. So what I believe I, I like to do is to develop a sequence of learning. So I'll explain that in just a second. 
Think about how you craft an explanation, build the mental models, address the misconceptions. And you know, it's taken me probably 20 years to get to where I am at the moment in crafting explanations with all the experience I've had of teaching in secondary as well as university. And then really develop the depth of that understanding with some questions that are in context and are authentic context. So let me just explain what I mean. So the first part of the sequence is number sense. And then I believe, you know, move on to multiplicative reasoning and then move on to describe what I'm calling describing relationships. So I'll just explain what I mean by each of those things. So number sense, unless you're dyscalculic, you have a number sense. So if I say the numbers five and three, you'll instinctively know that five is more than three, bigger than three. And you've got that sense because all the way through primary school, you were counting, you were using cuisinaire rods, you had all sorts of ways of representing number. When you go to fractions and decimals, people's number sense starts to get less secure. When you go to numbers expressed with index notation, less secure still. And if you go to negative powers, less secure even still. So starting from the point of view of negative powers, in my view, if, if we're taking the student with a B you know, or a six in, at GCSE, that is where I would start. And I'd be trying to develop number sense with these numbers negative powers and linked to that is prefixes so there are a lot of misconceptions around prefixes um, and a lot of um, quick fixes are done in school uh, which are not very helpful when you then get to university and particularly in biology so i haven't got time to talk about the sort of explanation that i use to develop number sense in this way but just to show you one of the questions so this is the sort of question I'm talking about, where we've got a, a filter with a poor diameter, deliberately used a prefix there. Um, and we're trying to look to see which would pass through the filter and which would not. And so these are deliberately not with prefixes. Um, and so they've got to do a couple of steps in here to try and work out which of these will pass through the filter and which won't. And if you've done this a lot, you'll be able to look at that straight away and you'll do it like that. But for a student who's just starting out, they will probably take a while to, to get their heads around this and get used to it. Um, okay, so then moving on to multiplicative reasoning. So there's a remarkable amount of reasoning with ratios that goes on in biology. And if you're a bit weak in reasoning with ratios and you're having to do it with negative numbers, and negative power uh, numbers, uh, which you're also weak with, then it's all likely to fall horribly wrong. So let's just have a little moment uh, to look at, at ratios and reasoning. And I just wanted to point this out because I'm not sure how commonly known this is. So when we talk about types of ratio in biology, we actually use two different types of ratio, um, but we're not very explicit when we switch from one to the other. So on the left is this first part, that's, that's, that's a part to part ratio. That's your typical ratio, that's like, three red to one white. That's um, what you use for Mendelian ratios or nutrient ratios or whatever. But in dilutions, we use part to whole ratios. So this is where we talk about a one in five dilution or three in four flowers, three out of four. And often we'll speak of these in terms of fractions rather than ratios. But for some reason, when we talk about dilutions, we, we use the ratio notation. Um, so at the bottom here, I've got a, a bar model uh, visual to sort of, I, I think, explains what I mean. But um, when, we're, when we're talking and we're using language, we need to be really careful that we're making clear to students which sort of ratio we're talking about. Because I think this is potentially a source of, of confusion, potentially misconception. Okay, so how do we scaffold ratio reasoning? Um, so if you're teaching online, you know, you can use a lot of drawing and, and um, a lot of diagrammatic tools really easily. So this is the bar model approach, which I have to say has really transformed my teaching of maths. Um, and this is this shows quite neatly, I think, how if you increase something by 50% and then decrease it by 50%, you don't get out what you put in. Now, I think that's obvious, but 
it's remarkable how many people can actually do really very well in their GCSE maths and not really appreciate that. Um, another example of bar model, this is actually a question that my daughter messaged me. It's a first year environmental management course. Um, and mom, help, type of message. Um, so we've got an MPK ratio of 5 to 7 to 4. The total weight's 500 grams. How, many for, how much phosphorus will it contain? And all I did really was I drew a bar model where I said, look, five parts, seven parts, four parts, all adds up to 500. And before I'd even drawn the bottom of the bar model in this diagram, she went, oh yeah, oh yeah, that makes sense, I know what to do now. So I think the bar model is really powerful. And um, if you're struggling to explain these sorts of ratio calculations, I think that's one way to go really. The other way is a ratio square. So I'm just going to um, explain this. So here we've got a scale bar of 10 micrometers and the ratio to the ruler. So that's about 42 millimeters. And if we want to know the length of the cell, I'll call that X. And the ruler is reading, can I say that's 34 millimeters? So now if you're trying to sort of scaffold this sort of reasoning, you need to know about the idea of equivalent ratios, which these will be, because they're off the same diagram. And then with ratios, we can say, well, how do we get from 10 to 42? We multiply by 4.2. If we're going backwards, we divide by 4.2. Because these are equivalent ratios, we know we need to do the same thing with that one. So 34 divided by 4.2 gives me 8.1. And there's my answer. I could have done it on the sideways as well. It works just as well. Um, but that just helps to make, so the ratio square and the bar model just help to make the reasoning visible, um, which I think just sort of reduces a bit of cognitive load. And it, I've had a lot better responses with students when I've used this sort of approach than the old ways I used to do it before. Okay, and then finally, describing relationships. Um, this is what you might have called algebra, but I don't like calling it algebra because that just puts people off. What do we want them to do with algebra in biology? We want them to recognize if something is it an exponential de decay equation. Like if we put up an equation, we, we don't want them to be put off. We want them to be able to see those symbols and actually relate to something visual. And I think the way to do that is graph sketching using a spreadsheet um, because it's quick and it's easy and um, they can see, you know, they change it constant and they can see the shape of the graph change really quickly and they can make the association between the symbols and the graph, which I think is absolutely critical. There are probably more things in an ideal world we'd like them to do with algebra, but realistically, have we got time to really teach them by science degree? Let me just go on to the final thing, which is, is that all? So should we be more ambitious? Um, and this is a quote from the Vision and Change Report in the US. Again, that's 10 years ago. But um, you know, they're really pushing this idea of, of biologists being able to use modeling and simulation. Do biologists really know what a mathematical model is and where mathematical models come from? And with all the COVID modeling stuff at the moment, it's just so, so important. Um, I, we put in an extra lecture that I did this year on you know, the meaning of R and, and, um, and you know, all the sort of, and what is, what is modeling. Um, I just wanted to leave that with you because I, I just think it's such a shame for a biologist to go all the way through an undergraduate degree and not really understand what a mathematical model is and, and what it does for um, reasoning and, and understanding complex systems. So finally, the book on the left is coming out next year. So everything I've been talking about today in more detail, so the explanations and questions and everything. Um, so it's being published by AUP. That's going to production scarily in a couple of weeks' time. Um, so, yeah, so Don Hawkins and myself have been doing the maths and stats behind all of the chapters, all of the volumes from molecules right through to populations, which has been a really interesting learning process for me. Um, if you want to know how to explain stuff, uh, simple maths, 
um, you know how to do it, but you're not quite sure how to explain it to other people who don't get it the way you get it. These are the two books that I have on my shelf that I would thoroughly recommend. They're easy reading, easy to dip into, and have a lot of the links to the literature. Um, so yeah, there you go. That's, uh, oh, and if you wanted to know how I did all of that writing, there's, that's the setup, except my desk isn't quite as tidy as that anymore. <laughs> um, so this is, that's what I was using, a, a pen input device. It's just a USB connection um, and it just maps to, that's why I was looking to the right all the time, because I've got it mapped onto that monitor, not onto the monitor with the webcam. Um, so sorry about that. <laughs> I hope that wasn't disconcerting. Um, but there we go. Thank you very much. Any questions is fine. Uh, how do I unshare? Do I just click that one? No. Yeah, uh, an option at the top of the screen to say to stop sharing or end share. So yeah, there we go. Ah, there we go. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Jenny, thank you so much. That was really educational. Um, we've had so many comments in the chat about sort of, you know, uh, you know what a fantastic tool that was. Um, the question we've had from David is, uh, have you considered using sliders in Excel to change constants? I was just thinking of that, that's yeah. a way of making a simple tool. Um, and actually, as, I was going to ask something similar about using VBA uh, with locked worksheets where you can change parameters and you see the graph change in real time. That's yeah. Yeah, yeah. So actually in the AUP book, what we're doing is um, we've got a series of um, talk throughs where I record my screen and set up a spreadsheet to draw um, you, know, you put the in, insert the formula in um, and then it draws the graph and then you can have a slider that changes the parameters and see how the graph changes and all that sort of thing. But what we were thinking and actually answers one of the questions from before was to um, you know, we build up from the very basics of using Excel to calculate things um, right through to drawing graphs and um, uh, we don't do any of the stats on Excel. But yeah, there's a lot that can be done. And that would feed back in quite nicely to what Nia was saying about students coming in with quite low levels of um, experience of using Excel. So Yeah, yeah, it's, it's interesting that it's so variable um you know, the, the extent to which they can use things like spreadsheets i think could you expand a little bit you, you mentioned that there's some shortcuts taken in in teaching maths in school in terms of uh, the the prefixes they're using could you expand what you mean by that because that's not something i've really experienced with my students so, so what do you what, what do you mean by that um there's things like the triangle method to for rearranging equations do you know what i mean by that yeah yeah, yeah. there's a lot of people who said they don't like it it's, yeah it's not good it's just it doesn't it doesn't help you it's a sticking plaster it 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 helps you get through the exam that's in front of you but it doesn't help you to reason mathematically so you know with medical students they they don't know how the the mathematical problem is going to hit them. It could come in all sorts of different contexts and and with different amounts of information. Um, so they need to be able to reason mathematically, and they need to reason. So a lot of the time they just want to be told where's the formula. Let me plug in the numbers, check you know get something out. Or um, yeah, it's I'm just trying to think of of other there's there's. There's lots of examples I'm just starting to think of at the moment. I think it, it, it also stems from, uh, from the maths in the A-level, you know, A-level biology, for example, where the biology teachers aren't necessarily confident themselves in teaching the mathematical bits of the biology. So they'll, they'll say, oh, this is how you do it, which was their way of, of doing it, but it doesn't really explain it as such. It doesn't it doesn't allow the students to reason. And, and I don't know, I, I, I sort of would really, my ideal would be that they, they know how to reason and have an intuitive sense of, of how things work. I just had a comment that came into the chat from Zara. It said, one of the books I recommend to our first years and onwards is Maths from Scratch. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's quite a lot of, um, similar sorts of books around and um, yeah so how, how much of this do you think actually stems back from there's quite a lot of evidence in schools that teachers are telling students they are either good at maths or bad at maths and they get maths oh, or they don't 
And yeah. maths is a skill like anything else. If you practice it, you get better at it. Mm, so absolutely. how much of that do you think feeds back to that kind of that dialogue from teachers at, you know, in, in GCSE or before? Absolutely, yeah. And and I have to say, when I was teaching, you know, some of the sciences, you just don't really have the time to really teach things properly. And you know, in in physics, for example, I you know, I with some of the students, I ended up using the triangle method for getting them to rearrange you know, speed equals distance over time, just because they didn't get it the first way and, and I tried different ways and, and ultimately all they wanted was to get through the exam and, and when it's a few weeks before the exam your your responsibility is to get them the best grade that you can not to really yeah that that's your primary goal at that stage sadly um which is disappointing um but you know when when you come to university students I would argue that if you should have left that behind and they, they should be starting to to use reasoning processes and and, and to think mathematically um, so yes definitely the, the particularly GCSE maths uh, because don't forget a lot of the maths teachers in school are, are not maths teaching experts you, know, you get PE teachers and biology teachers and geography teachers being hauled in to teach maths because there aren't enough maths teachers to go around. Mm. Um, so you know, students are not necessarily being taught by people who really understand the pedagogy behind maths. And it's all very well to say, yeah, you're good at maths, but you can't necessarily teach it. Um, you know, being able to teach maths is a completely different kettle of fish to being good at maths. And I mean, one of the things I, I was always told is that in China, Japan, one of the reasons that uh, the, ch the kids that come from there are quite good at maths is that they are taught in a totally different way, where they are told this is the answer to a problem, prove it. And the answer is wrong. And the students go through all of the iterations of how they could possibly try to get to that answer and realise that the answer is incorrect. But they have a much firmer understanding of the processes. It's, is that something you to try? Yes, so there are, I mean, the bar model that I showed, I think, originated in Singapore. Um, and there's been a lot that we've learned. So there's a, a, a lot of, um, a, a whole range of other approaches that I haven't spoken about. Yes, yeah, so, so there's um, goal-free problems, which are really lovely, where you just give some information and say, what can you work out from that? Which, which sort of loosens them from the strictures of the whole formulaic uh, exam questions. So that's really nice. And that's something I want to try with the medics actually. Um, there's same surface, different problem where the, the, the setup is the same, but there's four different questions about the same setup, um, which is also quite a nice one. I'm not sure I could think of four different questions about the same setup. And then there's various things like variation theory, getting them to recognize patterns. There's all sorts of approaches now that have, I'm not sure how many of them came from China and Singapore and how many of them, well, I don't know where they originated originally, but um, yeah, there's lots and lots of approaches. Um, and that's what I, I really enjoyed about teaching in secondary is that I got to learn all of these approaches. So I've now got so much more in my toolbox, if you like, that I can use to, to bring to bear in, in, in teaching um, the medics. Um, and we have a BSc course as well, so, and a foundation year. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to really share some of these approaches and um, you know, over the next year, I guess what I'd like to do is, is to think more about the sort of maths anxiety and confidence issues and, and to see whether my idea of just asking them how confident they feel, putting in interventions where I anticipate they're going to have difficulty um, and see to what extent that gets, um, you know, to what extent that's successful. So if anybody else is interested in, in things like that, then uh, yeah, it'd be lovely to, to talk with any sort of like-minded maths enthusiasts. I, I, just, I don't realize I'm monopolizing the questions. So there aren't any popping up in the chat, but it, the, the bar graph that you showed right at the start in terms of which students had what qualifications at different in institutions, do you see 
differences in terms of the types of institutions that, that students go to. So, um, for example, you know, if it's a Russell group or if it's post 92, are you seeing differences in in the profiles of students depending on where they end up in, in HE? Yes, oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think the the one that was entirely A level North Cambridge is pretty much I don't think it's 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 officially entirely A level, but it's 99.999% A level maths. Uh, even for the life sciences, which it didn't used to be uh, when I was there. Um, yeah, and then other universities, yeah, they're, they're looking at a B or below at, at, at GCSE. And, and I, I took the names off the institutions when I drew the bar graph because I, I, I didn't have permission to share that information. But um, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, you just have to look at the UCAS tariff and the entry requirements for the different courses. Um, you know, that there, uh, I think possibly the biggest stumbling block is what I alluded to earlier, which was the issue that I don't think people setting up the admissions or, or setting up the courses necessarily know actually what's covered or, or what a, an average student can be expected to know when they arrive. And you know, that idea of logarithms, the number of times I've explained to people, they don't do logarithms. You can't expect them to understand it. You know, you need to put in place some explanation of logarithms if you want them to know about logarithms. Um, <laughs> I keep doing that until I'm blue in the face. Um, but it's not just logarithms, of course. It's, yeah, that's why I wanted to include that, that, that section I did at the beginning of, of you know, these are the sorts of, broadly speaking, the sorts of things that you can anticipate they will and won't be able to do. And therefore, if that's what you want them to be able to do, you're going to have to put in place that teaching or you're going to have to change your entry requirements. Okay. And I, I get the impression that a lot of biologists don't really want to teach the maths, don't really feel it's part of their job to teach the maths. Um, and so it sort of falls through the gaps because people either don't feel they want to teach it or don't feel able to teach it don't feel like it's their job don't feel like it but I would argue it's part of biology and as a pharmacologist I spend my life calculating EC50s and PKAs and PKDs and and half-lives and stuff like that so yeah, it's, I'm, it's bread I'm, and butter for me yeah, I'm particularly interested in this just because one of the modules that I coordinate in our first year is a study skills module, which has a heavy element in the first teaching block of molar calculations. So mm. knowing, talking about this is, is, is great. Mm. Uh, this question that David's asked actually said, do you have any strategies for mixed groups? I have a first year cohort with some A-level at A, some GCSE at C. So what would your strategy be? Yeah, so I think, um, I think it depends what you're teaching. Um, but certainly what I what I would do would be to do a, a blend. So you, for the A's at A-level, you can probably give them a few videos that explain stuff and lots of practice questions. And, and, and you know, I'm, I'm gonna look into these goal-free problems and, and different ways of, of asking, getting them to think, basically. Um, and the a, A's at A-level, I would let them go off on their own it's the ones who've got the C at GCSE who are going to really need the nurturing and need, they're the ones that will benefit from your time input the most. Um, so for them, I would try to put in some sort of face-to-face, -face, you know, interactive session with them where you bring them through gradually because if, if, you, if you dump questions that are too hard on them too soon, they're going to just, I can't do this and it's going to be head in the sand and you know that was my mistake this year at Nottingham I, I sort of over assumed and I was in a rush I didn't really have time and, and I, I sent out this sort of set of questions assuming that they might have done it before and gosh did I get back all <laughs> stress stress and anxiety um so I would go slowly slowly with the, the ones with the C at, at GCSE 